Good morning, everyone. I know you're all a little bit hungover right now, so bear with me for a minute. Uh, my name is Zach Faisal. I'm a managing partner at Urbane Security. Regrettably, Paul could not be here today, so I apologize if it's a little rough on the edges of this presentation, as I'll be filling in for his parts. Um, but we're going to get things started the way I start every talk. And it's a little unpopular because a lot of people will get on the stage and preach to you for a long time, but I always start the talks with saying, don't believe anything I'm about to say. Too often we have people on stage serving as experts, and they are, but we blindly accept what they're presenting, what they're saying, uh, and especially when it comes to topics of security and trust and reliability, we should be questioning everything we see. Um, so question everything, even me. Question the stuff you're going to see here. And if you see something that's blatantly wrong or something that needs to be corrected, don't be afraid to ever call bullshit, whether it's on stage or it's privately to the side or online. Call it out and let's fix it and make it better. Um, and this is a hat tip to Bruce Potter, who's actually the one who started this whole trend of saying call bullshit. Um, first off, uh, for those of you who don't know, Paul's with MyMonero. Uh, MyMonero is a mobile and web application to support Monero without having to download the entire blockchain to verify how many funds you have, but maintaining that privacy of your spend key on your device. I'm over at Urbane Security. Uh, we're a security consultancy that focuses on the high-tech sector, as well as Fortune 500 Enterprise, providing tailored security services on implementation, remediation, and design. Um, so what are we talking about today? So the topic was a little vague about what was going on, is revolutionizing website resource integrity. Um, so right now, the team at MyMonero is facing a lot of security risks for their web-based service that relies on JavaScript. And a lot of other web wallets are, as well as other things like password managers and things that really rely on client-side processing of JavaScript. That way, they're designed to protect against if the server side is compromised, there's not a loss of information to the user. Uh, and there's a few gaps in security risks as a user that if you're putting this high value information inside of this resource and not sharing it with there, that could be impacted if the client side code is impacted. So the team at MyMonero, along with Fluffy Pony, wanted to come up with a proposal for a new protocol and a new implementation to protect against this. And so we'll talk about that and the implementation that they came up with. So my Monero's attack concerns really focused on that cryptocurrency obviously can be spent with your private spend keys. Uh, and my Monero protects that, like I was saying, with JavaScript on the client side, and such that makes the JavaScript very juicy and useful to use. Uh, and they've faced a lot of targeted phishing attacks against their domain using Google Ads and other like double-click um, targeted ad campaigns using domains that had Unicode or Punicode uh, characters to basically get people over to a different site and enter the information. And so they want a way to validate that instead of just looking at the domain and the certificates. Um, they were also concerned about the potential of a man in the middle of attack due to a rogue certificate. Maybe not necessarily a nation state or a compromised CA, but in a lot of cases we've been seeing also that there's compromises of client-side code that had a man in the middle TLS cert and were able to take and go that way. Um, they were also worried about insider attacks from their providers they were using uh, at data centers, colo facilities that may result in someone who may not be on the MyMonero team or other team of a trusted thing uh, to take an impact that device and modify that client-side code. And outside of just their concerns, when they talk to us, we really want to look at a few of the other attacks that they could face. And so obviously, we, we develop with a lot of these services a lot of trust inside of the chain for these web services from the content distribution networks, uh, whether it's uh, caching, uh, anti-DOS, WAF, and also a lot of these cloud services because we want to maintain the availability uh, across a diverse set of users. And further, we're doing a lot more CI and CD with this website code that we're, it's not tradi traditional deployment way uh, as we would have desktop code. So these TLS endpoints and getting a valid TLS cert in a lot of cases could be viewed as an attacker winning. Basically, we're trusting this TLS cert as the end all be all. This site is the one I intended to be. Uh, and obviously, EVSL has really kind of gone by the wayside as being the, the defecto as we move to more common domain validation of TLS certificates. So these short-term attacks against TLS could result in a longer-term yield, whether it's against the core service or even targeted against certain users, such as, say, the Wi-Fi at this space. Um, and so the detection and monitoring response of these kind of things against the issuance of TLS certs or attacks against the chain is really burdensome if you're a smaller project and you're not a large enterprise in which you would have a large number of users to monitor this from a diverse geographic. 
Now, there's also resource integrity verification through SRI. However, SRI for JavaScript and CSS only works for uh, in band with the HTML content, so you're trusting that source HTML content is secure and trusted. Obviously, if you were compromised the original service, you could compromise that internal HTML as well. So it was really designed only to trust content from third-party CDNs when the wave of CDNs were what they were back in the old day. Um, and I say old day like five years ago. But <laughs> instead of trusting that that content is good on the CDN because the third-party provider, you would use SRI hashes to take and validate it that way. Um, and like I was saying with TLS, it doesn't protect against compromise of the service or the content inside that trusted chain. So if someone does get access to, say, the backend service or an API key and is able to change that, we're trusting the TLS connection as our end-all, be-all for that site being valid and trusted. So while certificate transparency is gaining a lot of traction, especially thanks to Google making it a requirement for new issued certificates, uh, it's very reactive and not preventative. And it requires constant monitoring against that certificate, which is difficult to do, like I said, if you're a small team. And CAA records inside DNS wouldn't actually fully protect against it unless you set it to allow none, and all CAs would respect that. And it doesn't resolve the issue of the rogue or compromised CA. So with all these things, you can do a lot of things right to do hardening if you're doing a web service or another mobile service with APIs uh, to protect against this. But at the end of the day, uh, there's a lot of holes in this that could exist whether you're implementing it and you forget one thing. And all it takes is that forgetting of that one thing or that one break in the chain to result in the compromise of all the users of that service. And like I said, we're seeing a large number of increasing attacks against JavaScript as we saw with, and I hate to always name names, but uh, like Newegg got faced with a major Trojan that went after their users by modifying the client-side code to scrape credit cards and new card ads that way. Uh, which is a very big concern when you're talking about web wallets. So, like I was saying, the team at MyMonero, along with Fluffy, came up with this idea of what could we do in order to do some kind of validation and verification and start this trend of not a formal RFC just yet and something that the browsers have to adopt right now, but what if we self-starter this and create a preventative control that uses a side channel to validate um, the, the content that's being provided it addresses the core risk we're concerned about and isn't just something that's funny and pretty. Uh, it minimizes the overhead of implementation. It doesn't require a long set of things. It's open. It's open source and standard and implementation. And it bridges that gap between the usability as well as the actual security. So they came up with this idea called Secure Browse. Now, Secure Browse as an algorithm uses SRI hashes um, content, so the actual hashing content, the SHA hashes, within a DNS TXT record that's then signed by DNSSEC. This provides an out-of-band method to verify that the content on the site is actually what's intended by using DNS signed records. And then on the client side, you would validate that that signed record and that signed TXT record is actually valid. Um, this would then take and ensure that all the validation is on the client side and would effectively and hopefully, if implemented right, would prevent execution of malicious JavaScript or CSS content or HTML content if a site was compromised because the hashes on the DNS side weren't matched. So to give you an example for the hashes, this is all I know it's very small to see. Uh, and if you're watching online, I'm sure it's a little easier. But this will be on the RFC, and I'll post the, show the link at the end on the last slide. But this is the typical flow of what a secure browse protocol implementation would look like inside of a browser, along with a sample of the TXT records. As you can see, it uses the, the path of the file with the SHA hash of what would effectively would be the SRI hash inside the DNS TXT record. Um, so in order to take and proof of concept this, uh, my Monero, along with Brian Chuck, and a huge round of applause for Brian, he actually did a great uh, implementation of this, um, uses in Chrome, Firefox, and Safari an additional browser plugin that uses D DNS over HTTP, DOH, uh, by way of Cloudflare currently. Uh, we're working on configuring it so you can pick your own DOH provider, but right now it's just Cloudflare. And then does the DNSSEC validation all the way back to those RR SIGs and all the way back to the DS keys on the client side instead of just trusting the response that was given so you can independently on your client side validate that. And thereby, it's a blocking plugin, so it's actually synchronous in those requests for any configured domain. So if the content doesn't match, instead of just alerting you, hey, there's a problem, and at which point is too late in JavaScript ex exploitation, it actually blocks the execution of that. On top of that, to address the phishing issue, they started implementing some uh, detection for phishing domains or configured domains. So things like puny code wouldn't work, and it would alert the user before you did anything. Now, the execution wouldn't do anything because it's a completely different domain, but to stop you from entering anything that's private. Um, I have enough time for demo, actually. Let's see if we can make this work. So just to give you a quick 30-second demo of the plugin, and to the left here. 
And I have to do this off of small screen, so I apologize if this is going to be a little janky. So up here, we can see the secure browse browser plugin, not to be confused with the protocol, uh, as test is implemented. MyMonero.com has actually deployed it on their domain. It's kind of the first test POC if you want to try it out. Uh, and you'll see this little green icon that shows the page has been verified, the scripts that are verified, the number of style sheets that are verified, and that the source HTML is verified. And like I showed in the previous example, the DNS TST, TXT records that also exist. We also set up testsecurebrowse.org to kind of give the different use cases of when things don't work out right. So hopefully, I'm praying to the demo gods it's going to work right. If we go to like a page that has HTML that isn't actually signed or isn't actually validated, blocks. So it doesn't even prevent the execution of it. It tells you that this page is blocked and that you need to look into it further. And then for sites that are not signed, such as Twitter, you would see in the little drop down that it's not even verified, it's not in your trusted list at all. And the settings are super simple. All it is is basically a list of domains that you want to validate and have tests and have the active blocking. Now, these domains don't have to be enabled in order to get the thumbs up. They're actually optional, but the blocking, it needs to be manually enrolled. So that's the browser plugin. And I know I'm going to go through fast because I have four minutes to go. Uh, so. Um, and we're really excited about trying this out and seeing if the cryptocurrency market really wants to take and adopt this for their sites as well, for any web wallets. Um, so version one of our RFC is up, and it's on GitLab right now. And it'll be on the last slide, so you don't have to take a photo of this one just yet. Uh, as well as the protocol and the browser plugin are completely open source, and you can self-compile it, as well as build versions there. Uh, and we're actually really excited about what kind of what phase two might bring. And you might be like, well, you just kind of released this. What, what are you talking about phase two? So right now, we want to see if this is actually a concept that people want to adopt. Again, this is really going to be focusing on community involvement, and people want to actually use this in leverages versus coming down from on high. Um, so we want to validate the adoption, the benefits, and the effectiveness of Secure Browse as it is right now. However, we've had a lot of conversations about the limitations of what the current protocol has and focused on a phase two approach as well, which focuses on signing the content in band of the HTML, JavaScript, and CSS using comments with GPG signatures. DNSSEC and DNS would still be utilized as a sideband in order to take and validate those, the signing key of those signatures and provide a link to that key that would be imported by the browser client. This would then address the risk of DNS compromise, not require it to be only web services, but then also address HTML-based UI, such as Electron, React, uh, and other offline static content that you may be using by trusting it through the GPG signed key of that content delivered in line. Not there yet. It's right now currently in the RFC stage for it, but we wanted to see if people were going to actually adopt this and use this before we move to kind of re-implementing and redesigning this. So with Secure Browse, obviously, there's a few limitations. There's no security thing is ever proven. And if anyone doesn't tell you there's limitations with what they're doing, they're full of shit. Um, first and foremost is this is only focused on the client-side validation of code before the execution. It doesn't protect against any in-data transit. So if you have good known code, but you still compromise the server and you're sending any sensitive data there, that still would be compromisable by the other endpoint. I was really focused on those kind of, in this space, the web wallets that are using the client-side protection of the keys. It does not protect against DOM-based XSS, so it would not protect against anything such as, I don't know, bad coding. Um, and right now, it doesn't protect against DNS compromise. Now, the thought behind this is obviously it would be a side channel that your DNS would rotate much slower, be a separate set of authentication. So if you compromise the web service, you wouldn't have compromise of that. It is a big glaring issue right now, and that's why the phase two thing was really proposed. Um, next slide is not going. Come on. So to recap, SRI in browsers is not the way to solve the problem of validating JavaScript. Uh, Secure Browse, on uh, the words of Paul, offers a solid method to ensure resource integrity and preventing malicious resources from executing. I'm not full of words like that. Uh, tons of exciting possibilities in that phase two limitation we talked about, and MyMonero is really committing to this, as well as there's community adoption and excitement for it. So for the links, if you want to, oh. <laughs> How long has that been up? It's been up for a little bit. Yeah, that sucks. Uh, let me go back here. Thanks, guys. Obviously, this is a demo laptop. You can pull it back up now. Um, so in order to get to Secure Browse, um, this is the splash page for Secure Browse. Um, as well as if there's any known issues or you want to contribute at all, there's the actual GitLab. Uh, I know we are running short on time, so I'll be happy to address any questions, concerns, or feedback on the side. But really, like I said, we're looking for anyone who wants to make involvement to this to either implement their own web-based service or to provide security feedback. We're definitely open to comments and suggestions. That's all I have, so thank you very much, everyone. Mm -hmm.